Mission Hill was ahead of its time. Probably the one sentence central to any discussion of this long-forgotten cult TV hit. It aired on the WB for its first six episodes before getting abruptly cancelled while much of the first season was still in production. Adult Swim later revived the series long enough to air the remainder of the first season, what 13 episodes had actually been finished, before quietly retiring it to obscurity where it sadly remains to this day. The cancellation wasn't sudden or unexpected. Mission Hill was a total commercial flop. In part, this was due to the WB's mishandling of the show. It was at first crammed in a time slot surrounded by live-action shows, then got passed around from slot to slot before quickly and quietly getting dropped. To quote series creator Bill Oakley, We hugely damaged the ratings of those other shows. It came at a time where the WB was just beginning to find its niche within the daytime television market as the place for teen dramas, but it was a show that seemed to market itself heavily towards young adults, already jaded by the broken promises of the real world. But another aspect of why the show was cancelled was due to the overall misreading of the media landscape at the time it came out. The market was flooded with an abundance of animated sitcoms, hoping to cash in on the recent successes of shows like The Simpsons, something that is even lampshaded within the first episode of the series. Ironically, for a show so far ahead of its time, it actually came too late. Like with my other video essays, this one will be split into individual episode retrospectives, which themselves are split into four parts. Recap, Rant, Review, and Wrap-Up. Recap is a brief summary of most of the episode's plotlines. Rant is a section describing one aspect of the show as a whole, relative to how it appears in the episode. Review is a general detailing of my opinions on the episode, as well as some context for those opinions, and Wrap-Up is largely anything I couldn't find another place for. Oh, and one more thing before I start properly. The actual order of the episode seems to vary pretty wildly between what's on the DVDs, the wiki pages, and their actual air dates. If the series seems out of order from what you remember, this is why. The Douchebag Aspect Our first introduction to the French siblings, Andy and Kevin, but more importantly to Mission Hill itself. The plot details Kevin's stuck-up suburban vibes clashing with Andy's more laid-back slacker energy. The two have an animosity that only siblings share, which is spurred on by Kevin's unfamiliarity with the faster pace of urban living. In the end, Kevin's attempts to match his brother's lifestyle fail as he gets in trouble at school and makes an ass of himself at a party. Andy is left to pick up the pieces as he feels in part responsible for Kevin's breakdown. While the show Mission Hill has many interesting characters, perhaps none of them is quite as important as the district of Mission Hill itself. Despite its strangeness, or perhaps because of it, Mission Hill serves as an everywhere USA for urban spaces, much in the same way that Springfield of The Simpsons fame was to suburbia. In the same vein, every character of the show is simultaneously eccentric to an absurd degree, while also being down-to-earth enough to relate and connect to them. It is these eccentricities that make the relatable elements much more noticeable. Finding common ground with a personality-less self-insert feels like pandering, but a wacky guy in a wacky city with the same problems as you can help to show just how universal many human struggles really are. The first episode of the show, and one with the typical sitcom job of explaining how the characters got to where they are before letting the setting run with itself. Following the trend of many contemporary sitcoms, Mission Hill is semi-serialized. So while individual episodes more often than not stand on their own, certain plot developments will persist through the future. For example, Andy was planned to get a new job at a rate of about twice per season, while Kevin was meant to steadily progress through high school as the show went on. We never got to see much of either of these developments, as Mission Hill was taken off the air before Andy had changed careers but once. But the commitment to continuity is clear even within the early seasons. Right away, you can see the show's ability to make a good joke, but punchlines aren't always so connected to the actual plot of the episode, and often they can feel tacked on or forced, even if the jokes themselves do land. Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein themselves cameo in the episode, observing Kevin after a few too many goober geigers. They also voice George and Toby, so every time something bad happens to one of those two characters, which is often, it's just a bit of self-depreciating ripping. Overall, I find the douchebag aspect a great pilot that manages to get over much of the weirdness so many shows tend to have in their first episode. It shows a strong discipline to keep the level of focus that the writers had in making this show, and the quality more than speaks for itself. 
Andy joins the PTA, or Great Sexpectations. Andy attends Kevin's parent-teacher night on their parents' behalf only to fall for Kevin's English teacher, Mrs. Peck. Hoping to appear as a loving and supportive older brother, Andy joins the PTA so he can get into Mrs. Peck's pants. This goes awry when his attempts backfire on an uninterested Kevin, who's playing an online game with Toby. Kevin sells Toby into slavery, in the game, not real life, and so Toby swears to get his revenge against those who wronged him, again, in the game, not real life. The biggest driving force behind many plots of Mission Hill is sex. Andy, and to a lesser extent Kevin, have a tendency to create a rising action in plotlines by falling for a woman. Really. Great expectations, one bang for two brothers, how to get head in business without really trying, hot for weirdy, day of the jackass, I married a gay man from outer space, and crap gets in your eyes all start because one or both of the main characters is trying to get into another character's pants. That's 7 for 18. I even for an early aughts sitcom. But the way that relationships are betrayed in Mission Hill is part of what elevates it above many other shows of its time. Whereas many sitcoms will drag out a will-they-won't-they they relationship for nine seasons, Mission Hill plays with that trope in the character of Gwen. To call her Andy's girlfriend would be dramatically simplifying their relationship, as well as her character. Even the steady relationships in the show are non-traditional. Natalie Leibowitz Hernandez and Carlos Hernandez are portrayed as life partners, a term designed to separate itself from patriarchal traditions and repressive systems of the past, which is reflected in the way they raise their child. And then there's Gus and Wally. The long-time loving relationship that best fits the mold of what audiences are used to seeing is between two gay characters. In fact, the only truly traditional relationships portrayed are those of major characters as parents, shown as a boomerism more than anything else. In this episode, we see Andy engaging in pretty stereotypical sitcom antics, pretending he loves his younger brother to impress a woman. Ironically, at the end of the episode, he goes out of his way to make sure Kevin is alright, even carrying the boy home after he falls into a sewer. The two have a close relationship even if neither one really acknowledges that they do. This is the sort of character dynamic that makes sitcoms watchable and rewatchable. The characters themselves are figuring each other out just as much as we are, and being able to take the journey alongside them is what makes each milestone that much more memorable. This is also very much a time capsule episode. Everything from the out-of-date acts that PTA tries to arrange for the children to the dial-up internet Kevin uses for his game gives a sense of nostalgia for an early era of the digital age. Who else remembers asking their parents not to use the phone while they were online? Overall, it's very sitcom-y, but that helps to bring more attention to the emotional core of the episode, which is strong enough to deserve that spotlight. Kevin's Problem, or Porno for Pyro Kevin is asked to manage the gang family's grocery for a time, only to end up burning the bathroom down in an attempt to destroy a pornographic magazine he was reading. Thankfully, two of his peers were robbing the store at the time, and caught the blame for the arson. But when Andy starts to treat Kevin well after having almost lost him, the guilt gets to the boy's head, and soon he's pressured into confessing the truth, so that the two, mostly innocent boys don't get arrested. Oh, and the entire town starts wearing the hottest Japanese fashion, Karai Pantsu. The relationship between Andy and Kevin is perhaps the backbone of the entire show. A majority of the episodes have some sort of plot involving the way the two of them influence each other, and more often than not, if one has an epiphany, it's because of the other brother. Additionally, the show will often have a character end up right where they began the episode, no better off for their efforts. Typically, this would come across as being a depressing message for a show to have. Try as much as you want, you'll never change anything. But far from letting this stagnation become a negative sign, many episodes end with the two brothers together, showing that, no matter what happens, so long as they have each other, their normal lives can't be that bad. Telling of this relationship is perhaps the degree to which Andy's opinions influence Kevin's actions. Kevin's teachers are over the moon at the news of Griffo and Sea Dog's arrests. The guidance counselor tries to implore Kevin to lie. Even the defense attorney isn't enthusiastic about defending his client. Kevin is in a position to give as many people what they want as possible while also covering himself, and yet the single person who wants him to tell the truth ends up winning out in the end. He would rather tell his shame to everyone than disappoint his older brother, and that perhaps says more about the two than anything else. The B plot of this episode is entirely disconnected from the A plot. There's no consequence intermingled between the two outside of a few punchlines, but it still serves as a nice pacing tool to break up other segments while also providing a laugh here and there, so it meets the bare minimum requirements for a B-plot. 
Overall, this is one of the more memorable episodes of the series, not just because of how thematically consistent it is with the rest of the show, but in how it runs through the general gist of a Mission Hill plotline so quickly. You get some heartfelt moments, a few good laughs, and some on-the-nose lampshading about how justice is done in the cartoon world, with the gang family lamenting that the boys who burnt their store to the ground are escaping justice, all because he didn't give a rousing speech. Andy vs. The Real World or the Big Ass Viacom Lawsuit. While snooping through Andy's closet, Kevin finds a collection of old VCR tapes of the time that Andy appeared on a reality TV show titled The Real World. Jim tells Kevin the story associated with the videotapes and is soon joined by Posey and the rest of the house. Their story details how the group was at first opposed to the show coming in and gentrifying their neighborhood, sending Andy in to infiltrate the show's cast and destroy it from the inside. But the allure of potential fame proved too much for Andy and he began genuinely trying to fit in with the rest of the cast. After realizing how much he hates being recorded every waking moment, he decides to call for help and is rescued by his real friends. Art, media, and pop culture is something that is inherently always under attack. We turn to artistic endeavors so that we can comfort the disturbed and disturb the comforted, but when an entity is trying to gain profit through mass market appeal, the concept of true art becomes a threat. Corporatism and nationalism are the enemies of creativity since art is regularly the end result of disestablishmentarianism. It's hard to be creative when you're just going along with what the government or some shareholders want you to do. This is why the words soulless and cash grab are synonymous. It's much easier to make merchandise out of culture than it is out of counterculture. This episode sets up an aspect of Andy's character that's interesting as far as fictional leads go, and that's his pursuit of fame and recognition. Andy wants the spotlight, and we see him both stray from other things and remember this passion as the series goes on. He prides himself on staying slightly ahead of trends, is willing to give up lucrative business deals later on when he gets a taste of recognition, and Andy's dedication to being noticed is actually what drives a large number of plots later on in the series. So seeing him betray his friends at this point in the show comes across as very consistent with his future behavior, just as much as it is consistent that he's willing to give up that fame to reconnect with those who really matter to him, his friends and family. This episode is very pop culture heavy, even in respect to the rest of the series, but rather than using the references as punchlines in and of themselves, they're used to support a more cohesive underlying message about the effect corporatism can have on society. The cultural zeitgeist of the time was torn between hoping to stand out as much as possible and hoping to blend in with everyone else, and Andy in this episode serves as an audience surrogate in navigating these conflicting feelings. Andy and Kevin make a friend, or one bang for two brothers. Andy drunkenly agrees to go to a movie with Kevin only for both boys to meet and promptly fall for George's older sister, Tina. They attend a sci-fi convention as a group where the two constantly try to one-up each other before she tells them off for their immaturity. But since her vision was obstructed during the scolding, they both disagree on who she was really referring to. In the B-plot, Gus gets stabbed in the head with a knife. It doesn't bother him much, but Wally is upset over the negative attention he's getting and winds up welding random objects to the blade until Gus agrees to have it looked at. As a parallel to my previous review's anti-pop culture rant, this section will take the opposite stance. As much as popular culture tends to come about as a result of corporate types pushing for profitability, the entire system isn't corrupt in the same way. For each faceless black-suited entity trying to make a quick buck, there is an equal and opposite force. People who have a genuine passion for what they do make up the majority of creatively driven industries, and as a result, many of the people who create nerd-centric media tend to be just as obsessed with the material as the fans. To use a simpler example, Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein created Mission Hill because they wanted to, not because they were hoping to get rich. As such, pop culture exists as a sort of in-group full of very like-minded people, an in-group that's so large that all the problems of the world start to seem irrelevant and small in comparison. So many shows and books and movies are products of the time and place in which they were created, and yet practically every continent on the planet has at least one sect of Simpsons fans. Plus, tropes like the hero's journey predate written language. It makes humanity feel very small, like we've never really grown that distant from each other. As similar as Kevin and Andy are, this episode details just how different their worlds really are. 
Kevin is playing what he believes to be the slow game, wooing Tina from a distance and hoping to make an emotional connection first before, quote, making his move. Andy, on the other hand, is a lot more direct, his method of seduction being significantly less antiquated and recognizing that women aren't prizes that you win by checking off a certain number of nice guy boxes. That's not to say that Kevin is a future incel, a mere summer on an image ward away from changing his Facebook profile picture to Heath Leather's Joker. We see in the second half of this season that his approach to socialization can actually lead to decent relationships on his own terms. No one's ever shamed for their sexuality in the narrative, no matter the form it takes. I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that this episode features one of Tom Kenny's early incarnations of the now iconic Spongebob voice coming from his role as Ewok Villager number 2. Andy gets a promotion, or how to get head in business without really trying. Lamenting his dead-end job and the fact that his true passion is taking him nowhere, Andy resentfully accepts a promotion from his sleazy manager where he receives more pay for doing less work. The new lifestyle is appealing to him at first, but concerning to his loved ones, especially Kevin who desperately tries to lure him away from the quote, dark side. In the end, right before buying a strip club, Andy learns that one of his works actually managed to get published, and remembers why he had passion in the first place, walking away from the life he once again resents. A large part of what made Mission Hill so timeless was the characters and how they lived their lives. The writers were able to succinctly capture the feel of millennial America, an era where the American dream began to feel more and more distant, and where hard work and success began feeling more and more separate. Many young Americans saw their parents, former hippies who protested Vietnam and got high at Woodstock, becoming corporate cutouts with barely the energy left to drink themselves to sleep. They began to wonder if there was more to life than sitting in traffic and mowing your lawn. None of the main cast of the show has what can be considered a rat race job. They all work in some capacity, the jobs of failures. The characters being examples of what happens to teenagers who don't go to college, as told by counselors trying to sell you to go to college. As far as character plots go, this episode is about as cut and dry as they get. Andy dislikes a thing, gets more involved with the thing, then his loved ones rescue him from himself, and he returns to disliking the thing again. But what this episode lacks in originality, it makes up for in its heart. Kevin sees that Andy is giving up on his dreams, all of his cartoons winding up in the trash can and despite not knowing the first thing about cartooning or animation or humor, knows that his brother will be unhappy without the dream. That first taste of success is all it takes to get Andy's head back into his old passions, and he begins pursuing his art career as before, knowing that he's been officially paid for publishing. The aspect of this episode that gives us the greatest concern for Andy's well-being isn't the fact that he's slowly becoming a worse and worse person as he goes further and further down the metaphorical sleaze hole, but the fact that he's barely changing at all as he goes down the metaphorical sleaze hole. The fact that that type of degeneracy comes so naturally shows that he was never that far removed from being the type of person he despises. Giving up on your dreams is one thing, but being a hypocrite is something else entirely. Kevin vs. the SAT, or Nocturnal Admissions Noting their lack of extracurriculars and not eager to join a sports team, Kevin and his friends aspire to crack a secret code used by the SAT computers that will guarantee them perfect scores. But when Kevin recruits the help of one of the school's jocks to get enough data for his computer, his friends abandon him on moral grounds, leaving Kevin to turn to more desperate means. In the end, he succeeds only to realize that, per the deal he made before, he would need to share the code with the jocks from before, potentially tarnishing the Ivy League. Meanwhile, a misleading massage ad leads Posey into trouble when a pimp misconstrues her home business as an impediment on his territory. There's always a strange sense of hypocrisy when someone is defamed for their collegiate aspirations. America has, for years, denigrated the blue-collar worker, using him as fodder for their insults directed towards those with poor education. How many times have you heard something along the lines of, if you don't study hard, you'll end up working as the garbage man from your teachers? Nobody tells us that the garbage man makes a better salary than your grade school teacher, and he usually has government benefits on top of all of that. This episode came out around the time that the push for college started going into overdrive in public schools and, ironically, the sanctity of the Ivy League as a place where the intellectually gifted go for a pure realm, where nerd is a compliment, 
was something that had already started on its way out of American culture. This is a pretty standard setup for a moral episode of any sitcom. The character involves wants a thing, they compromise their morals for the thing, they realize it wasn't worth the sacrifice, and they get rid of the thing. Funnily enough, Mission Hill parodies the same type of moral wrap-up in a later episode, Kevin Finds Love, but here it's played much more straight. Though I can't help but feel like there's either a lot missing from this episode or that it's stretched out too long. During the run, Kevin encounters a hermit who has dedicated his entire life to finding the code. This hermit has completely ruined his life in the pursuit, and at first it appears as though this is meant to be some sort of lesson for Kevin on the futility of the search. But in the end, he finds the code and the character is never brought up again. The ending also seems to miss an obvious point in favor of a comedic beat. Kevin is lamenting that the SAT is happening in a few minutes and he's totally unprepared having just thrown out the code. But didn't he just spend the majority of the last two weeks taking literally hundreds of practice tests? It seems like he'd be more prepared than anyone else. Overall, this episode feels like it was rushed or maybe unfinished. Maybe it was one of the first to be written, maybe put together at the last second. It's not a bad episode of television, just a bad episode of Mission Hill. Unemployment Part 1, or Brother's Big Boner After spending the last of his money, Andy finds out that he is unemployed due to Ron skimping out on his taxes. He works a few various jobs for a time, unwilling to get his former employer to sign a proof of employment form. When Kevin finally caves in and gets the form signed on Andy's behalf, Ron gifts him his luxury vehicle so the IRS can't seize it. This car ends up being an even further strain on their finances, however, and soon they find themselves completely broke again. That is, until the car is totaled and they get an insurance payout. Serialization was, for many decades, a bit of a minefield when it came to producing television. The idea that episodes needed to be watched in a specific order to make sense meant that the viewership of reruns would always be much lower and it would theoretically scare off potential new viewers. As a result, many shows functioned on a resetting continuity, where characters refused to change their lives and no lessons were ever really learned. In order to justify this, they had to have characters with happy, idyllic lives, showing that everything is alright and they don't need to change after all. But since Mission Hill tried to portray America in a more relatable way, cynicism and all, they couldn't really justify the characters wallowing in mediocrity without the show coming across as depressing. And so serialization was the only logical result. If Andy's boss gets arrested, he loses his job and he's not getting it back at the end of the episode. If Kevin gets caught manipulating himself in a convenience store bathroom, he's going to have new nicknames from those who caught him for the rest of the show. Unemployment Part 1 marks what is probably the first major shift the show undergoes. Andy was originally planned to get a new job about twice per season, and this episode is when that trend truly begins. Kevin is balancing the checkbook and beginning to show more responsibility around the apartment, a far cry from his childishness in the first episode. He's less likely to call for his parents when things aren't going his way, and more likely to look for a solution on his own. Interestingly, despite this episode showing off so much character change, it still sticks to a pretty standard Mission Hill formula. Andy does a new thing, the people around him are concerned, he gets a wake-up call, and vows to fix it himself. The difference being that the last of those three steps doesn't occur until the following episode. The overall moral of this episode is a funny inversion of the typical family sitcom morals, in that Kevin is punished for being responsible, while Andy is rewarded for his irresponsibility, at least according to the plot outline. From the subtext, we can see that we aren't really meant to envy either of the brothers. This isn't a story where everything happens for a sense of overall cosmic justice. Things just happen for no reason all the time, just like the real world. Unemployment Part 2, or Theory of the Leisure S. Andy is wallowing in his unemployment, hurting his relationships with those close to him. They all voice their concerns, but he refuses to change anything about his life until he loses a tooth to negligence. Learning that Jim has great dental insurance, he visits his friend at work to learn enough about the guy to commit insurance fraud. But this meeting serves as a wake-up call for Andy to get his life back on track and, with a lot of help from good old-fashioned nepotism, is able to finally land a career in advertising. Standardization was, for many decades, a bit of a minefield when it came to reducing television. 
The idea that characters had to return to their condition at the start of every episode by the end meant that the potential for evolving character arcs became extremely limited. There are only so many variations on the same plot you can do before the audience will start to feel like they've seen it all before, and so shows need to change things up every so often in order to keep interest. But this has the obstacle of introducing these changes to a new audience, an audience that could potentially miss an episode or two and be confused. So when something does change about a show, it has to be something that can be picked up quickly with little context. A character changing their lifestyle would take more explanation than a new character being included altogether, especially if that new character is just a few one-liners in a trench coat. This is why Mission Hill's version of standardization works so well with its themes. Rather than hoping for some sort of constant form of escapism in our lives, we instead root for the characters to escape their mundanity. We want Kevin to get into Yale, we want Andy to make his big break. We root for them to change, but we also hope they don't lose sight of what's also important, meaning that when nothing changes, or everything changes, the audience is nonetheless happy. No matter the situation the Frenches find themselves in, everybody around them seems so supportive. It's a type of unconditional love between friends that compels you to denigrate them into self-improvement and then immediately offer unconditional support when they make that attempt. People stand around drinking to Andy's interview not because they're happy that he's finally out of their hair, but because he's happy. They share their successes as much as they fight against any individual failures. Wally agrees to lie for Andy and serve as a reference, but when he chickens out, Gus steps in and, despite initially being against dishonesty, finds a middle ground where he can vouch for Andy's personality instead. Were it not for the fact that this show is realistic, we could have had a nice feel-good ending of everyone coming together to get Andy back on his feet, but Mission Hill, as eclectic as it is, is anything but unrealistic when it comes to serious things like employment, and it takes Jim pulling some strings to actually give Andy his happy ending. Kevin Finds Love, or Hot for Weirdy Hoping to get a recommendation letter from her father, Kevin begins dating the daughter of the co-inventor of the atomic bomb, but when he dies before being able to hand it over, the two of them sneak onto an army base in order to dig through his records and find it. Their escapades result in Kevin falling for Eunice for real, but the feelings aren't reciprocated and he winds up plus one recommendation and plus one broken heart. Meanwhile, Andy, Jim, and Posey get the rest of the building in on a prank to pretend that the water meter room is in fact the greatest club of their generation by not letting anyone in ever before pretending to have the entire thing burned down, if only to laugh at those who pretended to be in the know. Culture is an intangible object and is impossible to measure or quantify. As such, it can leave the same impression on those who witness it firsthand as those who only pretend to have done so. It's anybody who feels nostalgic for the good old days even though they never really lived through them. People who repost memes they don't know the original source of. And in Mission Hill, it's the meter room. The entire bit is poking fun at those who use culture as a mark of their identity, those who base their personality on the media they consume instead of their takeaways and experiences with that media. Or, God forbid, their personal experiences as quantified by themselves, rather than whatever they put onto social media. If you had a great summer but you didn't post any photos of it online, did it really happen? It's almost kind of comforting to see that almost two decades ago, this type of mentality was something that drew ridicule. Like so many of today's problems have actually been around for some time and, don't worry, society survives them. In this episode, we get to meet a girl who is considered in Kevin's League, a system introduced to the boy by Andy, though one I'm sure everyone who's gone through school has familiarized themselves with in some incarnation. Ironically, the very next episode subverts the entire concept of Leagues, making this bit of advice appear like a purely mental barrier. Or, you know, maybe Kevin is just that cool. Nah, the first one. This episode also has a cute subversion of the typical sitcom cliché of a character throwing away something they wanted at first because they viewed the sacrifice as not being worth it. Kevin throws the recommendation letter into the harbor, the MacGuffin he's been spending the whole episode pursuing, only to instantly realize how dumb that is and jumping in after it. Overall, this episode can probably best be described as cute. We see Kevin getting flustered over a girl, we see his initial impressions get blown away. Watching him slowly change his views on relationships from back where he was in Andy Joins the PTA to now shows a development in character that makes these plotlines more satisfying to view. Stories of Hope and Forgiveness, or Day of the Jackass Toby decides to walk to school for once, Posey hopes to achieve inner enlightenment, Andy gets a date to the Grammys, Kevin tries to keep up with the news, Natalie handcuffs herself to a government building, and the world seems to be coming to an end due to a vague threat. 
After all of this, the episode ends up with very little actually changing as all the plots wrap each other up in turn. The animation of Mission Hill is one of the things that makes it the most distinct from other cartoons of its time. The actual style of storyboarding involved a very meticulous attention to details in scenes that contemporary animation never would have used. When Andy and Kevin fight, each punch, kick, and bite is animated rather than having a dust cloud appear to obscure the action. Movement and flow was meant to draw heavily from older animation styles, though this was mixed with a vibrant use of hand-painted cells using the bright fluorescent colors of the late 20th century. So despite releasing during an era where the adult animated comedy market was heavily oversaturated, Mission Hill was ironically able to stand apart by straddling the current era, combining older elements that still worked, while handpicking the modern animation techniques that they deemed as improvements. And while I'm sure the extra man hours involved in creating an episode of Mission Hill did no favors for convincing executives that the show was worth the cost, we fans today more than appreciate the labor of love that we got. I think the Day of the Jackass best exemplifies the strengths of Mission Hill as a show by practically flaunting how little things like plot actually matter. We're not here to see grand set pieces or celebrity cameos. We want to see the characters. So a vague threat is looming in the background of this episode that we only hear referred to in the vaguest of terms. It's not important. The effect it has on the cast is. Andy gets a date with a fictional celebrity because the guest stars aren't the real draw. We only care about the characters we've grown to know so well over the last seasons. This episode has so many various plot lines that mirror each other. Everybody seems to be struggling except for Andy during the first half, but as his story takes a turn for the worse, those around him start to see their situations improve. And then when he finally makes it home to relax, he interrupts Posey's near enlightenment experience, as if the episode is positing that every good thing has its bad aspects and vice versa. In the end, all I can really take away from this episode outside of the feel-good ending is, well, let me have the episode speak for itself. Penis, 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 penis. Ah! Happy birthday, Kevin, or happy birthday, douchebag. It's Kevin's birthday, and Andy has plans for his entitled brat of a little brother, at least at first. Once he sees how depressed Kevin is at being just another faceless city nobody instead of a suburban somebody, he decides to throw a proper party. The party is a bust, though, since Andy doesn't really know what his brother wants. Kevin leaves, lamenting that he just wants to go home again, and Andy chases after him. Of course, we can't ever really go home, and the two lament that their adolescent days are not just over, but not really all they were cracked up to be in the first place. In the B-plot, Natalie rescues a snake from an animal testing facility, only to find out that it has seemingly eaten Baby Nameless, although it turns out just to be the baby monitor. It's strange to think on, but Mission Hill is a non-traditional coming-of-age story for Kevin French, the difference being that in a typical coming-of-age, the character in question undergoes some tribulation that forces them to undergo change, change which they reject at first before ultimately accepting the improvement to their life. But for Kevin, that change doesn't occur. While he adapts to the new environment, he doesn't have to change much about himself to do so, instead finding a niche that he can fit into and enjoying his life there. But it doesn't last forever, and soon Kevin begins to feel nostalgia for his earlier years, something which he can't recapture, as nostalgia is often a cherry-picked selection of the best of those times, while ignoring the myriad contradictory realities. In the end, it's not the simpler times that Kevin has to settle for, just the people from those times. Kevin fears that he may end up changing for the worse as a result of his new location, but when he reminisces with Andy and hears about how the two very nearly had identical experiences at the same age, He's able to feel optimism about the future again. Just seeing that people close to you have the same struggles makes those struggles feel much more manageable, or at the very least like they're not things to stress over. Regardless of whether Andy has changed for the worse, like Kevin is afraid to, he still looks up to his older brother, and so maybe that change isn't all that bad. The B-plot of this episode comes across as pretty underwhelming, but I realize that's because we've never really gotten much characterization for Carlos and Natalie. The two have a great dynamic and several good jokes during the episode, and the subplot makes me sad that we're never really able to see any more of the duo's attempts at raising their family. This is about as heartfelt as the show gets, the emotional beats resonating as well as they do because this episode comes so much later in the season, after we've learned so much about all the characters. Call it sappy, but sometimes a bit of sappiness isn't a bad thing. Planet Nine from Mission Hill, or I Married a Gay Man from Outer Space. 
Misunderstanding the film rating system, Kevin accidentally gets into Kino with the guidance of Wally who runs the local theater. After some time, the theater owner finds a print of an old B-movie that happens to have been directed by Wally in his youth. Excited, Kevin gets the whole neighborhood to watch it, only for the premiere to arrive and the movie revealed to be a total farce. Its poor quality being laughed at by everybody causes Wally to retreat into solitude, upset that he's now a laughingstock. But after hearing that the high value potential of the film was thrown away when Wally met Gus and fell in love, Kevin cheers up his friend by pointing out that he shouldn't be ashamed of the love letter, as well as the fact that the film has received a cult following in the vein of The Room or Rocky Horror. For the last several decades, there's been an image of the nuclear family pervasive throughout almost all American media. The father with the high paying union job, his domestic housewife raising their children, who are as numerous as the unique personalities the writer could come up with, so typically two and a half. But this was never quite as common as television like to pretend that it was. You only really found that dynamic in middle and upper class white heterosexual parts of the country, which admittedly made up the majority of most networks' advertising base. As the middle class died out in the 80s and onward, the nuclear family became less of a mirror and more of a relic of the past, a form of escapism that the modern audience could use as refuge from their own lives. But pretty soon audiences outgrew this nostalgia for a time they never knew, and the media of the day had to adapt. The traditional nuclear family became a tired, worn-out trope, and audiences wanted to see themselves on TV again. Mission Hill beat the curve in this regard, but just because you're early to the party doesn't mean they're starting without everyone else. This is probably the most famous episode of Mission Hill among people who have only ever heard of the show without watching it. Presenting Gus and Wally as an openly gay couple was unheard of at the time, and the fact that their plotlines have nothing to do with their sexuality is something that even modern shows struggle with. And yet this episode's plotline still benefits from having Wally be gay. I don't think that the decision to use Midnight Cowboy as a starting point for the plot was a coincidence. It was, after all, a movie that received an X rating because it depicted a homosexual character as anything but a punchline or a denouncement. The de facto finale of Mission Hill, but still a damn strong episode to end on. We end up seeing just how flexible the comedic muscles of the writing team are once they've established the characters to start writing more intricate plots. Wally, feeling like an outcast at the midpoint of this episode, hits much harder after it's been established that his family's a pillar of the community in Mission Hill. And of course, that means that the new niche he finds for themselves at the end is all the more satisfying to see him realize. Meditations on a Career in Advertising, or Super Tool As a bit of a warning, every episode from this point on is unfinished. All we have to work with are animatics, table reads, and scripts. As so much can change between writing, storyboarding, reading, animatics, and the finished product, these next few reviews can't be considered fully complete, but as you've made it this far into the video, I'm assuming that's not an issue. Andy, tired of always being overlooked at his new job, asks for Jim for an opportunity to really flex his creative muscles, and the two of them are tasked with creating a new logo for an Italian canned food company. Andy creates a well-received design, but like before, his talents are passed over and the praise is given to Jim instead. Frustrated, Andy converts the design into a crude depiction of genitalia before it's finalized, hoping to sabotage his friend's career. But in the end, the executives love the subliminal sex appeal even more. Meanwhile, Kevin and his friends rent a porta potty so they can go to the bathroom at school in peace, something which attracts the ire of the school's bullies. Probably one of the best feel-good endings of the show, and it, as all good things are, was aborted prematurely by the emotionless coat hanger of corporate profit-seeking. The nerds lock the bullies away in a porta potty to be shipped away to an unknown location, allowing them free reign of the school's restrooms, if only for an evening. Andy and Kevin make their peace with the power of Puritan American repression, and the humor throughout this episode was so spot on, I was able to laugh out loud a few times just speed reading it for the video. So much of the humor in this episode comes from what we know about the characters and their relationships to one another. We only root for Andy in the end because we've seen him spit a tooth into a cup of milk. We only root for Kevin because we saw him nearly burn to death in the convenience store bathroom. And we're able to root for Jim in all of this as well, despite this really being the first episode to call out any of his past lethargy. Though this is also the only time we really get to see it hurting his friends. Overall, Super Tool is probably one of the finest scripts the show has, doomed to forever exist as just that, a script. To Grandmother's House We Go, or Freaky Weekend in the Crappy Crud Wagon. With a three-day weekend ahead of them, Kevin, Andy, Jim, and Posey plan a road trip, although they disagree with where it is they actually want to go. 
Each person takes a turn being in charge, but one by one they're all mutinied away until in the end, Hosey's suggestion wins out, although it takes quite a bit of scheming on her part to make it that way. Meanwhile, Gus and Wally are dog-sitting Stogie, who misses his family and won't stop barking incessantly, forcing the remaining tenants to impersonate Andy and Kevin so they can sleep soundly. This episode gives a great amount of attention to every major character and really makes it feel like an ensemble cast kind of show. Especially compared to their earlier appearances, you start to get the impression that they're finally characters instead of vehicles for one-off gags. Posey in particular has really fleshed out from a generic flower child to a proper sociopath in such a subtle way that even the characters haven't really noticed how violent she can get. How much of this characterization was planned from the beginning and how much was developed on the spot as the writers got more familiar with them is something that we'll likely never know for sure, but regardless of the how, the what is still strong in its potential. Overall, this is a strong episode, at least as far as what we got in the animatic. The line delivery helps a lot in selling many of the punchlines in a way that's much better appreciated after the previous episode review. Things like Jim's Act 2 meltdown, Posey's manipulation, and Kevin sticking his head out of the seat cushion like he's in The Shining give this episode an overall weirdness that strongly harkens back to many of the Golden Age Simpsons episodes that the duo wrote before. Pretty in Pink, or Crap It's In Your Eyes after an argument over their relationship status, Gwen quote-unquote breaks up with Andy, leaving him to go to a yuppie bar with Jim to drink away his pain. The following morning, he realizes he's slept with Stacy, Jim's assistant. Not only that, but he's caught her pink eye, something that makes his later attempts to get back together with Gwen seem half-hearted and insincere. So he tries instead to win her over with a grand romantic gesture on the advice of Kevin, resulting in her new workplace getting burnt to the ground, which brings the couple back together on more permanent terms. As I've said before, Mission Hill subverts the typical will-they-won't-they they trope that so many other sitcoms like to lean into, instead using an are-they-aren't-they they set up for their main couple. Gwen has, for much of the show, resented her in-universe role as Andy's girlfriend, wanting to be seen as much more than that. This is reflected outside the universe and made more powerful by the fact that so many other shows were content to have their female cast exist as supporting roles to male leads. We don't get too much more Gwen in the rest of the show beyond this point, and I can't help but wonder how her role in the story may have changed. Would she have been reduced to nothing more than arm candy for Andy? Based on what we've seen of the show so far, that would be very unlikely, but we'll never have the confirmation for sure. There's a lot more done with Jim since Andy began his office job alongside him. We start to see a few cracks in what was previously an unflinching stoicism against a rapidly changing world, and we get an idea that Jim may have more issues than he really lets on as a result of his personality or lack thereof. But for now it's mostly humor, leaving the heavier potential ramifications unexplored. Death of a Yellman, or Premature Matriculation after a disastrous haircut leaves him bald, Kevin's friends mistakenly believe he's dying, and so they hope to grant him a final wish by getting him into Yale. The people at Yale, seeing a fundraising opportunity, send a letter of acceptance which immediately goes to Kevin's head. He begins acting like a jerk to the lesser people around him, before eventually realizing he's been taking it too far, when he's given a diploma during the fundraiser event. He gives an impassioned speech about how he doesn't deserve the diploma because he didn't earn it, and the elites at Yale love it. In the B-plot, Andy and Jim get angry about the increasing number of SUVs on the road and decide to buy a tractor to fight back. This episode riffs on the quote-unquote elite of society for both of its plotlines. From ruling class oligarchs in the government and high society in Kevin's plotline, to the upper class yuppies driving massive SUVs to keep their 1.5 kids safe in Andy's plotline. And while we can see that Andy and Jim have completely turned away from any ambitions to imitate the class they can't stand the mere presence of, Kevin hasn't quite come to that revelation yet, though this episode does seem to be hinting that he's taking the first steps in that direction. It would have been interesting to see how the boy evolves over the course of the show. It's doubtful he'll ever be as cynical and jaded as his older brother, but you know that the two were melding their personalities together, just enough that I can't help but imagine a hypothetical season 3 and onward where Kevin finally outright rejects the cookie cutter college crash course. Maybe there's a bit of extra irony in the fact that Andy purchases a tractor to terrorize the city SUVs. That he's using a tool of the blue-collar working class to fight against the rich suburbanite lifestyle of excess, but that's probably me reading too far into it. 
Another thing that I'm reading too far into is my ranting on how things like millennials are the first generation to lament the dying American dream, and the first time ever that a young adult has felt angst and anxiety towards the future. This episode gets its name, the other name, from Arthur Miller's play Death of a Salesman, written in 1949 about the bleakness of the future of the working class in America. So if you've held on on writing or an angry comment calling me an entitled millennial until now, congratulations on your restraint, I'm self-aware. I'll apologize now for any factual errors in my video. Most of what you might call research has been looking at shifts in the cultural experience, and sometimes facts take a backseat to opinions in that regard. Bye Bye Nerdy, or I Was a Teenage Porn Star A porn studio sets up in an empty room next to Andy and Kevin's, and upset at yet another source of noise, Kevin rages at them to shut up, which ends up in the final take of the movie. Soon the whole neighborhood has seen Kevin's cameo appearance, including his parents, who force him to move back to Wyoming with them. Kevin and Andy are both thrilled at no longer having to put up with each other, but it doesn't take long until Kevin and his father begin to miss their old lives. In the end, Mr. French has to bribe Andy to lie to his wife in order to have Kevin move back to Mission Hill. A plot designed to mirror the first episode and book into the first season. Episode 1 is about Kevin failing to adjust to Mission Hill, and episode 18 is about Kevin failing to adjust back home. This sort of trope where characters go back to the way things were for a time only to hate it is common in sitcoms to show how far the characters have developed over the season. But Mission Hill subverts it nicely by having Andy never actually break down and lament that he misses his brother, as you would expect if you've seen enough television. This episode was intended to be the finale of season 1, and it reads like a love letter to the show up to this point. So many past plot lines are not just referenced, but brought up to further the plot of the episode. Characters from before return to contribute to the overall conflict, and practically everybody gets a role, even if it is rather small. These are never played as simple, hey, remember this guy? bit roles. And a few characters who could have appeared, such as George's sister, Ron, Weirdy, and such, don't appear since it wouldn't make sense for them to do so, showing a healthy level of restraint and respect for their own work. Mission Hill, despite its brevity, or perhaps because of it, is probably one of the most underrated shows ever to air on television. We got a show that was quick to find its groove, offered a lot of potential, and got cancelled because it was presented to the wrong audience at the wrong time. There's always going to be a huge hole in the history of television, a what-if for this show catching on and gaining the same traction as something more popular, like The Simpsons or Futurama, is what I'd be saying if this story had an unhappy ending. The truth is that although Mission Hill was never successful, Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein were. The duo met in 8th grade and became close friends to the point of finishing each other's sentences. After graduating college, they wrote a spec script for Seinfeld that was enjoyed by the writing staff, but as they had no openings at the time, the duo were instead recommended to the team working on The Simpsons. During their tenure there, they wrote many envelope-pushing episodes, including 22 short films about Springfield, Mother Simpson, Homer vs. the 18th Amendment, and the often misunderstood Homer's enemy. Their time aboard is often considered to be the show's golden age, and that age is considered to end coinciding with their departure. Afterwards, they worked on Mission Hill together, which hopefully I've done a good job of selling, before moving on to various other projects, including consulting on Futurama. They went their separate ways after a contract dispute with Sony in 2009, which led to two parallel and equally accomplished careers. Oakley has since made a name for himself most notably on The Cleveland Show, Regular Show, and Disenchantment, and now travels the country reviewing fast food and giving out steamy awards, named for his timeless steamed hams gag from 22 short films about Springfield. Weinstein wrote for many episodes of Gravity Falls, as well as the Futurama revival from 2010 to 2013, also winding up on Disenchantment, which is old grade school buddy. Their quality of writing, passion for humor, and intimate ability to create truly profound emotional moments have been a consistent staple of everything they've worked on in their careers, and it doesn't appear as though they're close to calling it quits. Recently, the idea of a Mission Hill spin-off titled Gus and Wally has been floating around their Twitter pages, and a pilot script has been pitched to various networks. As the title implies, this show will focus on the older couple that runs the complex in which many episodes of Mission Hill took place, likely focusing on the older characters, as they're much closer to the age of the writers today. Whether it gets picked up is, as of this video, yet to be seen. 
going off script once again for the ending like I like to do. I also usually say something like, this isn't my usual content, don't expect more video essays, but at this point I feel like I've made so many of these, I suppose it'd be a lie to say that. I really, really like Mission Hill. I feel like it's basically on par with the quality of early Futurama or Golden Age Simpsons, and like, yeah, it's the same writers in charge of all of those shows, so it makes sense. Mission Hill's probably never getting a second season or a revival or anything. I'm actually not too optimistic, since if you look at it from a corporate perspective, no matter how accomplished the brains behind a project are, reviving or reimagining a commercial flop no one remembers from 20 years ago, it, it's not going to win against like an, I don't know, what's actually on TV these days. I, I gotta get out from living underneath this rock and get into like a bigger, more popular rock with the uh, like TV nerd crowd. I need to kill this metaphor. Even if there was a sudden surge in popularity, I don't think Oakley and Weinstein even want to bring Mission Hill back. They wrote a 20-something unemployed aspiring cartoonist at a time when they were 20-something creative types, and now they're 50-somethings who have already made it, so the Gus and Wally reboot makes a lot more sense, and the characters are they are going to be the same age as the writers. You get better stories if you write what you know. Anyway, the next video essay um, will probably be released without any more fanfare than this one, or warning, I'll just kind of drop it off somewhere randomly. I don't want to make a schedule or big plans for the future of my channel since I'm doing all of these for fun. If I start to do things on a schedule or because there's an expectation that I should, then it stops being fun. And if I can't have fun making it, no one's going to have fun watching it. So subscribing to the channel isn't a guarantee that you'll be satisfied with whatever I end up making next. Liking the video is, you know what the buttons do. I don't have to baby you through it. If you comment, though, I will read the comment. I probably won't respond, but I do read everything. I'm not a YouTuber, so I don't have a YouTuber outro or anything like that. I don't have some cohesive underlying message to the video. It's just a retrospective of a show I really enjoyed, and hopefully a few people will watch it or rewatch it as a result. I doubt I'll start like a hashtag to revive it or anything. I just, I just think it's neat. It's like I said at the beginning, Mission Hill was ahead of its time.